Hello and welcome to the third webinar in our series for 2007, Implementation Equity 201, The Path Forward in Complete Streets. I'm uh, very excited here to, uh, um, to introduce the Integrating Complete Streets Vision Zero and Transportation Equity webinar in partnership with Livable Memphis, the Memphis Medical District, and the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. Uh, my name is Emiko Atherton, and I am the director of the National Complete Streets Coalition, which is a program of Smart Growth America. We're based out of Washington, D.C., but as I always say, we uh, work throughout the country, and I spend more of my time in communities in the United States than I do in D.C. Um, as a reminder, we're offering this webinar series this year to help advance the coalition's two primary goals, which are to promote the implementation and the equity within complete streets. Our first web webinar focused on the role of public health in complete streets, and a few weeks ago we hosted our separate second webinar on uh, calculating the return on investment for complete streets. Just so you know, both of those webinars were recorded and they're available on our website. Today we're going to be talking about really vision zero, equity in complete streets. And I wanted to start out just framing this, reminding people why vision zero is so important to complete streets. Vision zero um, is really a strategy to uh, reach zero, the goal of zero death um, traffic-related deaths in the country. Um, Vision Zero has a few strategies. There's the education uh, strategy, there's an enforcement, there's reducing speed limits, and then there's the engineering. And we at the Complete Streets Coalition really work in the education and engineering aspect of it, and so we are both educating people on why pedestrian fatalities and injuries as well as bicycle pedestrian, why traffic injuries fatalities occur, and then how we can use engineering and street design to prevent those injuries and fatalities. Uh, we publish a report every other year called Dangerous by Design, which looks at federal data, uh, it's uh, fatality analysis reporting statistics and walk-to-work data to develop what we call a PDI, the Pedestrian Danger Index, to identify the most dangerous places to walk in America. Unfortunately, one of the things we learned this year is that pedestrian fatalities are actually going up in the United States. If you look at the chart in front of you, you can see that pedestrian fatalities were going down between 2005 and 2009. That correlated with the Great Recession. Uh, people were out of work. They weren't traveling as much. They were using less discretionary spending. And as the economy rebounded, so too did pedestrian deaths. Uh, we believe qualitatively that it has to do with an increase in vehicle miles traveled, VMT, and people driving and taking uh, more work-related um, and social-related trips. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that we also learned in this, present, uh, in this analysis was that the people most disproportionately impacted by pedestrian fatalities were older adults and people of color. And you can see on this chart that people of color are 54% more likely to be struck and killed while walking uh, than the average U.S. population, and that older adults are 51% more likely to be struck and killed while walking. So we can see that pedestrian fatalities um, directly uh, impact vulnerable populations even more so. Um, so I'm really excited to offer this webinar today. I'm going to start off by turning it over to Byron Rushing, who is the president of the American, uh, I'm sorry, the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. I should say the APBP is a member and has been a member of the Complete Streets Coalition Steering Committee since the beginning. Um, Byron is now their president. He's also a transportation planner with the Atlanta Regional Commission focused on bicycling, walking, and livability planet. He served on the APBP board since 2005. Uh, most of his walking and bicycle trips are with his wife and two children. So with that, um, I will uh, turn it over to Byron for an introduction. Great. Thank you, Emiko. Can you hear me all right? And thanks, Emiko and the National Complete Streets Coalition for partnering with APPP on this webinar. Uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, that we get to work with uh, the coalition on this webinar at the Im intersection of implementation and uh, complete streets, safety, and equity, because so many of those 
are really cornerstone ideas for us, the Association of Pet Bike Professionals. Our role uh, for many of our members is to serve as the professional organization to help a wide diversity of uh, public and private sector staffs in their day-to-day -day decision making. We do a lot of that through technical work. We have a webinar series that we run ourselves and through um, a biannual seminar, which this year will be hosted in Memphis, uh, of no coincidence for our uh, fantastic panel speakers today. Um, and so really, so many of our members are wrestling with or dealing with or planning for uh, these specific questions around safety and equity, and we're very excited. I am particularly excited to get to speak at the front end of this because uh, I rely so heavily in my role at the Atlanta Regional Commission on the Coalition's Dangerous by Design report, and I think it's one of the really leading documents that's stressing that importance between safety planning and equity planning, and it's really um, become a linchpin for us as we tackle with these issues ourselves, and, and we're working on a, a Vision Zero plan and a safety action plan this year, and we really rely on this so heavily. And I know many of our members with APBP do as well. And so again, thank you for having us. Um, I know we're going to touch on a little bit later, but if anybody's interested in our professional development seminar, that will be this year from June 26th to 29th in Memphis, like I said. Um, it's one reason why we're uh, so excited to have John Paul um, and our other great panel speakers today really stressing that local work and illustrating some of the things that APBP does to help uh, bring these kind of ideas all around the country. So with that, Emiko, I'll turn it back over to you um, and looking forward to listening to the rest of it. Thanks so much, Byron. And next I want to start off by introducing our first presentation. Um, it is on <clears throat> implementing Complete Streets through a community development approach. Um, I want to introduce John Paul Schaefer, who is the program director at Livable Memphis. And I actually got to talk to um, John Paul when I first started this job and I was doing a lot of phone calls to see who's working on complete streets at the community level, who's doing really great work, and someone referred me to John Paul. So it's so great that, you know, well over a year later, um, we're able to have him on this webinar. Uh, John Paul Schaefer is AICP, and he's the Executive Director of the Community Development Council of Greater Memphis. Uh, the CD Council's work supports the revitalization of Memphis neighborhoods through capacity building for community development corporations public policy and advocacy, and increased community engagement. John Paul was most recently a director of the CD Council's Livable Memphis program and previously worked as a transportation planner for the Memphis MPO, or Metropolitan Planning Organization. He also currently serves as board chair of Bike Walk Tennessee and as a board secretary of Explore Bike Share, the organization working to bring bike share to Memphis. John holds a BA in Jazz Studies from the University of New Orleans, I can't think of a better place to study jazz, and a Master's in City and Regional Planning from the University of Memphis. He's a native Memphian who has also lived in New Orleans in the Los Angeles area. So thank you so much for joining us today, John Paul. Thanks, Emiko. Um, yeah, really pleased to be invited to talk about some of the work that's going on in Memphis. Yeah, I wish I could have brought four or five other panelists on just to talk about some of the great you know, neighborhood and, and citywide work that's going on. Um, but I'll you know, be trying to give a little bit of our local perspective and, and talk a, a little bit about what goes into kind of our thinking around implementing complete streets, integrating equity into that, um, and then kind of putting all of that in, in light of uh, or in perspective with our, our current planning efforts. So I'll just breeze through a couple of these. So um, yeah, Community Development Council uh, has been around for you know, over 15 years as a nonprofit serving the community development industry citywide. Um, I did run the Livable Memphis program, which was really focused on uh, advocacy and outreach and, and you know, being a technical resource for some of our neighborhood partners. Uh, but ultimately, you know, our, our goal is to promote healthy growth and revitalization of, of neighborhoods in Memphis. Um, this just kind of touches on a few things that we've done over the years. You know, we've worked on, um, you know, getting the city to reorient its policies on, on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, transit funding, looking at kind of the ordinances about, you know, traffic laws and things like that. Um, and really just taking that neighborhood approach to um, making sure that, you know, we have livable places in our community that, where people can access transportation. 
So when I started to put this uh, presentation together, I think I stared at this blank slide asking this question, what is transportation equity for um, longer than I should have. Um, but I just wanted to put this up here for a second and let everybody on the line kind of you know, take a, a moment to think about what it means to them personally um, and say that you know, our experiences in Memphis you know, are it's, it's an ongoing process, and I don't think we're going to solve everybody's problems um, nationwide, but you know, happy to share some of this perspective, but keep in mind that you know, this is a, a continual question we need to ask ourselves. Um, so then obviously the next thing you do is you, you do a Google search um, and come up with you know, what I think is a fairly accepted definition of, of transportation equity that about it, you know, transportation and being able to you know, have access and mobility and it be affordable and reliable is really getting down to being a civil and human right. Um, you know, it's, it's about how people are able to access what is in our communities. It also um, will change heavily you know, based on context and local needs. Um, this is something, you know, not just transportation equity, but equity in general, something we're really exploring through this um, Strong, Prosperous, and Resilient Communities Challenge grant that we got along with you know, five other regions around the country and looking at how the built environment and our communities really affect you know, health, climate, resilience, and, and racial equity, you know, being very specific about what type of equity we're talking about. Um, I also, you know, through that process, am learning that you know, equity means something completely different to uh, people from different backgrounds and from neighborhoods. And, you know, where I, coming from a point of privilege, may look at a greenway trail and see just the benefits and the opportunities that come along with it. Um, somebody from the communities we're working in may look at it and see, you know, kind of misplaced priorities or signs of, you know, gentrification and displacement that are coming down the line. And so our challenge really is to get to a place where, you know, complete streets or, or however we're talking about it means kind of improved quality of life in, an, in a more inclusive way and that, that the benefits of these things become more evident. Um, again, you know, this is a conversation that's going to continue to go on. Um, we also learn that it's, it's about, you know, it's about the outcomes. We want an equitable outcome, but it's also about the process. I mean, people really want to say in how their community is designed or redesigned, um, they want to know that investments are there for them, not just someone who's being attracted to kind of take their place. Um, you know, and on a specific level, I think that um, having 100 traffic deaths a year and knowing that you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of those are pedestrians, even given our low commute share by pedestrian uh, mode, uh, is really not equitable. Um, so just some kind of context about uh, Memphis generally. Uh, just to give you a sense, we have an idea of who's affected uh, by an inequitable transportation system. Um, Memphis and the region as well has a lot of you know, low automobile access. Um, you know, 30,000, 12 percent of Memphis households don't have an access to an automobile at all. Uh, we have more than 11,000 people walking to work or to catch a bus to work every day. Uh, and we do know that you know, on average, 20 percent of deaths in traffic each year are pedestrians. Um, in Memphis, uh, African Americans make up you know, 70 percent of those 11,000 people walking to work or to transit. Uh, that actually is pretty in line with our, our demographic breakdown. Uh, but we also know that a lot of school age students are walking to school every day. Um, we know that uh, 8 percent of Mem Memphis residents have some sort of disability that requires a mobility device. Uh, and we also know, you know, kind of the overall number of pedestrians involved in a crash each year on average. I've got to keep up on my slides here. Um, we know that we can start to put some kind of price tags on maintaining um, our infrastructure in a way that, that allows access for people who have you know, mobility challenges or who may not own an automobile and are using the transit system. Um, just to kind of put that in perspective, one of the things um, we, we know we have is this huge amount of sidewalk network, um, you know, that's valued at over a billion dollars. And we know that we should be spending close to $20 million a year uh, on maintaining that, but that over the past, you know, 10 years or so, we've spent a very small percentage of that. Um, and we know that it creates 
burdens on asking homeowners to replace uh, pedestrian infrastructure. Um, you know, we are replacing curb ramps at a, a fairly good clip, uh, but kind of what's in between those and how are we getting at, you know, make sure, making sure that that infrastructure is accessible. And then just in terms of Memphis, I mean, if anyone's familiar with Memphis, you know, it's a very uh, low density city. Um, we have really kept up with population by expanding geographically. Uh, so it creates some real you know, mismatch between where people are living and where they're, they're working. Uh, we have a really high burden of house, housing and transportation costs, you know, being about 52% uh, of household income. Um, we also know that we have a really high utility and energy burden, so kind of adding all of those fixed costs in. Um, another thing that really impacts transportation equity is that we don't have a dedicated local source uh, for transit. And we've seen that over the years, as you know, the amount of money we're putting into there goes goes less far and less far. That, that ridership is kind of tracking downward with the uh, with funding cuts, um, you know, and that that influences how people can access jobs, education, all those kinds of uh, opportunities. So, kind of switching gears a little bit and looking at how we are considering transportation equity in some of our planning efforts. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done in the past five years is, you know, have all of the jurisdictions in our in our region, our MPO region, uh, adopt this Mid South Regional Green Print that really looks at um, green spaces and trails and on street um, bicycling and pedestrian network, but really ties that into housing and jobs and and health and you know had a real focus on social equity. Uh, so again, kind of being clear about what what type or what you know track of equity we're we're addressing? Um, you know, a couple of things to really pull out here is again, it's about outcomes. Uh, we're talking about like some of the implementation effects, um, but also about the process. You know, about making sure that there aren't barriers to actually participating in this planning process. You know, whether it's language barriers or um, you know, access to public meetings and things like that, uh, but really being sure that, that the, the voice of the community comes out in these plans. Uh, another planning effort that has um, impl implications on complete streets and, and traffic safety and all these things, um, we have done, you know, to get at that $1 billion sidewalk problem, uh, we actually have done a plan now uh, that, that prioritizes our greatest needs for, uh, for pedestrian infrastructure. And it was really geared around um, school access, um, you know, kind of looking at um, the neighborhood connections into schools, you know, it was a, a way to kind of put, you know, we, um, young people forward as kind of like, um, you know, a very important part of, of complete streets and uh, traffic safety. We know that you know young people are are highly represented in those pedestrian crashes that are happening in the city. You know beyond what their their share of the population is. Um, so equity in this in this case, uh, it's kind of woven throughout some of these other categories and some of these other criteria, like making sure that there's transit access or um, you know there's stakeholder and public input and and safety considerations, uh, but also calling out equity in and of itself as one of these ranking criteria. And just to give you an idea of how that was done, you know, really it still is kind of a, a geographic approach, um, kind of looking at census tracts around the city that have these higher than average rates of households living below poverty or living in poverty, uh, zero vehicle households, um, non-white population, and then the limited English proficiency. Uh, and then kind of overlaying along with those other criteria, the proposed projects um, in this plan, and to kind of target some of the areas that have seen more disinvestment that are likely to have the older sidewalk network that needs uh, more attention now. And then one final um, planning effort that we're going to, well not one final one, but the, the current planning effort we're doing is this Memphis 3.0 comprehensive plan. It's the first time in uh, nearly 40 years that Memphis will have a, a citywide comprehensive plan. Um, and, you know, this, we're still in the fairly early stages of this. Um, you know, I'm leading a complete streets working group that's kind of providing a, a technical viewpoint um, on how we weave complete streets kind of throughout these four pillars of the plan that are based on, you know, connectivity, 
livability, opportunity, and sustainability. But you know, even in this early stage of the plan, it's important to see that the city has made clear statements on you know, what their guiding principles are, and you know, including equity and opportunity for all in those statements. Um, a lot of this comes out of previous work like the regional green print. Um, so it's not being developed in a vacuum by a planning staff. It really is kind of building on those past plans. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this directly when I go through some of our complete streets work. Um, so we, as a you know, uh, community development uh, nonprofit, work directly with a lot of neighborhood-based organizations, uh, whether they're community development corporations or other uh, stakeholders in that, that um, redevelopment and revitalization process. Um, but we have you know, recognized throughout the years what an important role transportation and traffic safety play in uh, developing communities. So you know, one of the first things that we worked on was really kind of getting to a point where we're institutionalizing the process for um, providing more complete streets. Uh, you know, we saw early on that some of the challenges, even to just having kind of a blanket policy where that, you know, it didn't have that design guidance. Um, it was still subject to political processes. Um, you know, it wasn't clear how these things, uh, how these projects were moving through city agencies. Um, so we worked through the Mid-South Green Print to do a complete streets project delivery manual uh, for the city. And you know, one of the most important parts of that was having this very clear um, workflow of how a, how a development project or how a roadway project moves through the different city agencies. You know, at what points do they engage the public in that process? How do we kind of um, track the communications and that decision-making process? Um, you know, again, to make sure that the process is uh, consistent and therefore you know, somewhat more transparent. Uh, another key component of that was really reorienting, like, um, and this is another kind of clear statement from the city. You know, it's about we are looking at the most vulnerable roadway users and giving them the highest order of consideration when we're making these these changes to roadways and and to public spaces. Um, and then a final piece, and this again will kind of go into more detail in this comprehensive planning process that we're doing now, um, was coming up with. Uh, a system of road typology. So looking at a functional classification system and saying how can we make that more context sensitive and tie it to you know, land uses in neighborhood X and, and neighborhood Y um, and give it really that, that local context. Um, this was done at a very high level analysis, this roadway regulatory plan. Um, but we're seeing a real opportunity now through the Memphis 3.0 comprehensive plan to go into a deeper dive. Um, Part of that planning process will be doing 14 district plans of the 14 kind of subdivisions of the city. Um, so through that process uh, and some, some scenario planning, we'll be able to really get down to a neighborhood level um, and, and have that, that input and, and vision attached to uh, what types of roadway networks we're, we're promoting. You know, I want to call out a couple of uh, neighborhood efforts you know, where we've got strong uh, CDCs or other organizations that are working on um, kind of comprehensive planning at a neighborhood level, but out of that we've seen a lot of uh, transportation projects emerge. You know, we think that, or we see that, um, you know, pedestrian infrastructure is, is a real need in, in some of these neighborhoods, but also access to green space where, you know, physical activity can happen. Um, this is in the South Memphis neighborhood with one of our partners at the, the WORKS uh, CDC. You know, this plan really uh, identified need for better recreation and transportation access, whether it's getting to food or getting to jobs, getting to transit. Um, they also did some really great design charrettes around uh, an abandoned railway in the neighborhood where you know, people got to really come out and say, we want to see um, you know, personal safety is a big concern. Uh, not just traffic safety, so kind of making design recommendations for a secure environment, but also using this trail project as a way to kind of call out the character uh, of the individual neighborhoods that are located along that trail, um, you know, whether it's historic markers or things that are calling out some of the cultural uh, assets of the neighborhood. 
Uh, we've also seen that evolve into some of these um, projects, you know, where it's tying into our citywide um, bike share proposal. You know, and South Memphis now has kind of um, made that statement that you know we have trans you know, transportation access issues here. What are some of the solutions we can use to get to a more equitable transportation system? And one of those could be you know bringing bike share into some of these focused neighborhoods. Um, but really working with some of the neighborhood leaders to, lead, you know, to, to drive that process and bring people to the table through community engagement. Um, you know, I'm on the board of Explore Bike Share, and we've actually specified four seats on the board of directors there um, that are four neighborhood representatives from, from some of the target neighborhoods we're working in. Uh, again, you know, kind of tying some of those cultural assets. We've seen some other planning processes where uh, cultural tourism and things like that are really big um, community needs or community desires. Um, another thing that we've done kind of in partnership with some other organizations, we actually worked uh, with America Walks a few years ago and our local um, Center for Independent Living to develop a, a walkability toolkit um, that would kind of build the capacity of local organizations, whether they're neighborhood associations or, or just a group of residents who are interested in looking at uh, sidewalks and things like that. Uh, give them some tools to not just inventory, but also pursue some funding, some new infrastructure, and, and some policy change that kind of goes along with our, our mission of providing technical assistance and capacity building to organizations. Um, so this toolkit um, you know, has data pieces that are attached to it, uh, where you've got an app where you can go out and, and log and track uh, some of these walkability issues, uh, but also kind of brings that advocacy piece to it. You know, what are some ways you can follow up with property owners? How, are you, how can you put these things together uh, into a report and go to city council and, and ask for you know, improvements uh, to transportation facilities in your neighborhood? Um, it's also been featured by our administration as uh, an example of how the city works with nonprofits to kind of supplement what they, they can do uh, and kind of add value to uh, a city that is, you know, quite frankly, tapped for resources at this time. Um, one last project I'll talk about is just our work through the MemFix program, which is this kind of uh, tactical urbanism approach to doing streetscapes um, and some of the work that is happening in the medical district is kind of taking this approach and, and saying, well, we've tested out these, these roadway redesigns. How do we make them more permanent uh, using this kind of test driving and prototyping methodology? But again, kind of taking those experiences and, and distilling the lessons learned down into a tool that's, kind of, that's accessible to some of these neighborhood-based organizations uh, or to individuals who want to make some of these changes in their neighborhood and connecting them to resources for that implementation. Um, this process really has evolved from, you can kind of see on the upper left hand corner here, people out hand painting uh, a protected bike lane. Um, we've actually seen the, the partnership with the city evolve from a, you know, just hands off, we're observing this approach to actually getting in and, and making some of these improvements. It's allowed us to make some of these interim design improvements um, a little bit more permanent so that we can kind of demonstrate what a complete street looks like, uh, not just during an event, but also kind of you know, for six months, a year after that fact. Um, and it's, it's also encouraged them to go after funding to make some of these more permanent. Again, you know, it's um, working with the neighborhood organization to make sure that these lasting changes to the public realm um, can be sustained. So I'm going to come back to the question, what is equity, what is transportation equity, um, and one of the, some of the things that we've learned are you know, that it's, it's about affordability, uh, it's about uh, an inclusive process and inclusive results as well. Um, it is very context and neighborhood sensitive. Um, you know, it's about connecting people to opportunities and serving their needs. Um, you know, we think it's, it's and we know it's driven by the community and that the community should have a lot of input into uh, what's going on and implementing their own priorities. Um, we know that it's intersectional. We see you know, transportation woven into housing issues and poverty issues and access to, to jobs. 
Um, and then, you know, it's about having difficult conversations and looking at how decisions have been made in the past about transportation infrastructure and looking at structural racism and the role that that has played um, in how communities are shaped or reshaped. Um, you know, so this is something that our equity issues here in Memphis are so deeply rooted in poverty and, and racism. We know that we can't have this conversation without talking about those things. Um, I wish I had titled this how we're going to accomplish it all because um, we realize it's not just about funding. You know, it's really about shifting the process and the priorities. Um, you know, we've started to see Memphis go after more surface transportation funding to flex that to transit and we looked at how the MPO over the years has changed project criteria to make sure that complete streets becomes more institutionalized in projects and in the planning process. Um, it's about local commitments. You know, we're working through right now a statewide gas tax increase uh, that will probably largely go to roads, but we're looking at also wrapping into that a local option for funding transit. Um, we're seeing our transit agency really partner with the city on you know, that last mile connection of walking or biking to transit. You know, again, this billion dollar sidewalk uh, conundrum where we're looking at how do we prioritize these public investments in walkability while still understanding that a big part of this is going to come from property owners making repairs and how do we make uh, an equitable system where people can pay on their utility bill or, you know, we have now uh, an assistance program for elderly homeowners, homeowners with disabilities and, and low income households. And then, you know, public private partnerships, not, not in kind of privatizing trans transportation infrastructure or service, but um, in looking at how does philanthropy fit into this, how can we, you know, you, how can we bring neighborhood organizations to this process. Um, to really um, make sure that it, that it works and that it, it's sustainable um, and you know, realize that that's, that's not the, the overarching, overarching solution but kind of a starting off point uh, and a real world approach to, to making some of these changes. And with that, um, I believe I'm going to turn it back over to Emiko. Thank you so, uh, thank you so much, John Paul. That was, uh, Really fascinating for me, and I love how you walk through all those uh, real life examples. I see that many of you have questions, and we are going to get to them. Uh, so if you do have questions, please continue to put them in the chat box. We'll go ahead and spend the last part of the webinar going over questions. Um, but right now, I'm really excited to introduce Larissa Redmond Thompson, who is the founder and CEO of the Collegiate Life Investment Foundation, uh, CLIF. The mission of CLIF is to serve as the premier vehicle to inform drivers around the state of Tennessee about the dangers of distracted driving and to educate college-age students and those matriculated into college uh, preventable ways to avoid its negligence. Uh, Larissa is a proud graduate of the Christian Brothers University where she obtained a bachelor's degree in English literature. Uh, she also graduated from Atlanta's John Marshall Law School in 2005 with a JD or Juris Doctorate, as well as completed her studies at Capella University with a master's degree in public administration with a focus on nonprofit leadership. She currently works as the program associate for the Memphis Medical District Collaborative, where she is responsible for developing a pedestrian-focused Vision Zero comprehensive plan for the Memphis Medical District. Thank you so much for joining us today, Larissa. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to look at our organization, the Memphis Medical District, and our responsibility to make our district a more livable, economically prosperous, clean, and safe uh, place to live and work, and how that transpires to developing and launching a district-wide Vision Zero uh, strategy for the Memphis Medical District. So moving forward, we, we – Set down, and our organization is pretty young. We are a year old this February, and so we sat down to say, how could we really look at pedestrian safety um, and take Vision Zero strategies and campaigns that have been nationwide and really zero and focus that in into a Vision Zero campaign for the Memphis Medical District. And so we focused on really making this the first district-wide Vision Zero campaign to launch in the city of Memphis with a focus on pedestrian safety. 
And so moving forward, we wanted to answer this question of what is the Memphis Medical District and why is it important for us to focus on pedestrian advocacy. Um, the Memphis Medical District is defined by this 2.5 square mile area between downtown and midtown that you see on your screen, that, that map of boundaries that you see. And we serve as a vital connection between the two, downtown and midtown Memphis. And we service and home some of the country's most renowned medical institutions, as you can see on the map. Some you may be familiar with, St. Jude, Alsec, the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, Le Bonner's Children Medical Center. And so with these different medical and educational institutions, we have 16,000 employees, 8,000 students. Um, across a 250-plus acre of property. And so as you can imagine, this is a very, although Memphis is, the city is not as dense, this particular area, the Memphis Medical District, across our district boundaries, are a very, is a very dense area. And um, for, you know, upcoming potential community development projects, it's important that we think about our pedestrians their safety and ways that the MMDC can work with our partners to create a safe and walkable environment for all. So in looking at that, we wanted to come up with the overarching vision for our strategy. Uh, when we approach pedestrian advocacy in the beginning stages of developing this strategy, we wanted to look at and we thought felt it was very important to look at and develop a vision statement that clearly communicated to our constituents the importance of pedestrian safety within our medical district and then outline a very achievable goal for us to strive for as an as a organization. So therefore, we developed this campaign to really encourage a safe, walkable district um, by reducing the number of pedestrian-involved fatalities as well as seriously bodily injury crashes, which we know are not really included in a lot of Vision Zero campaigns, but we thought it was important um, that we acknowledge that some of these um, crashes that really change the trajectory of pedestrians' lives after they've been involved are important for us here in the medical district. And so we aim for this goal of 0% pedestrian fatalities and injuries by the year 2020. So if we look at the pedestrian, and John Paul kind of hit on some of this regarding our statistics here in Shelby County, and for those of the, those that are on the call who don't know, um, the city of Memphis encompasses about 70% of Shelby County, Tennessee. So our city limits takes up the majority of the Shelby County, and we can see in the last two years an uptake of pedestrian-involved crashes over that time. And so as crashes increase, but our need to provide the city with uh, more transit and opportunities and really efficiently use our green spaces is very important for us, not only at the Memphis, in the Memphis Medical District, but also in the city as a whole, to really focus on developing a type of infrastructure and educating our motorists within the city and our county to really help decrease some of those statistics that we see on our screen right now. Excuse me. Um, so we have elected to really take a 3E approach in launching our Vision Zero campaign for the Memphis Medical District. Uh, as you can see, our current and planned strategy focuses on the three E's, engineering, enforcement, and education. And of course, in um, national, nationwide uh, Vision Zero campaigns, you often see these three three E's reveal themselves in some type of way. And we've really focused on collaborating those three E's, therefore the overlapping of the image, and really focusing on collaborating with our partners to leverage um, the different activities we see moving forward with the campaign. So looking at the first E, I really won't take much time on the engineering aspect of our strategy. We started some work in 2016 um, with our streetscape project, and John Paul is actually going to follow my presentation with doing a, a good deep dive into this streetscape work. But I thought it was important to really highlight, um, at least for a brief moment, the streetscape work and how the MMDC approached uh, providing visible street transformations, um, which we thought would make, uh, which we thought would utilize our public spaces in the Memphis Medical District to make them more walk and bike friendly. 
So um, as Jean-Paul, in a few minutes, gets to deep dive, just keep in mind this engineering concept and how we're taking what he will talk about and embedding it into our pedestrian um, strategy as well as our overarching strategy for the Memphis Medical District moving into the future. The second E for our Vision Zero um, approach is enforcement, and we really looked at this in a two-phase approach. First, we felt that it was important to bring awareness within our district to the issues of the pedestrian space on a daily basis as well as current laws um, that we already have in place in the city to protect, protect, excuse me, protect pedestrians on our city streets. And so then we will follow that up with strong enforcement of these laws. So looking at the first phase of this second approach enforcement, that looks like really just bringing awareness to our um, that's through crosswalk, intercepts, in-road signs, uh, things of that nature, and really putting them on aware that I'm in an area saturated with pedestrians and I need to act and drive accordingly. After we do that, we want to really follow up with our relationships that we've developed with not only our local police force, which is Memphis Police Department, but also with the policing and security agencies within the district, such as UT Police, who has a very strong presence in our district, as well as Southwest Tennessee College, which is also located in our district. Uh, we think it's really important to partner with these policing agencies to increase patrol and enforcement around pedestrian safety and to really encourage uh, drivers to adhere to the law. And so that is the two-phase approach with enforcement is something we're looking to do within this next year, um, getting with our contacts at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center Police Force, at Southwest, at the various security agencies, um, at the hospitals we named within our district earlier in the presentation, and really coming up with a plan to um, first make motorists aware and then second increase advance, uh, advance enforcement. So moving into the last prong of our 3E strategy, education, um, we really felt that this could arguably be the most important um, part of our strategy when we look at reaching the masses. Um, this is not to really dilute the importance of engineering and enforcement, not only in our strategy, but in Vision Zero strategies across the nation, but in but when we look at education, it really provides a very public-facing tactic, and it really creates open dialogue amongst citizens about pedestrian safety, not only for the Memphis Medical District, but how we can leverage what we're doing in the Memphis Medical District and kind of influence some other districts around the city of Memphis. So for that and for the Memphis, specifically for the Memphis Medical District, this looks like providing some type of tactical written collateral. Uh, we work with our branding partners at DCA to really um, bring the character of the district as well as the information um, and awareness, pedestrian awareness to this collateral um, to really educate motorists and pedestrians alike. Uh, we want to provide pedestrians with awareness swag. Everybody loves swag now, so we want to provide them with pins and stickers and wristbands to say, I am a pedestrian, I am encouraging pedestrian safety, look out for me. And that is a big way in really encouraging our drivers on our streets within the Memphis Medical District to really take notice to our pedestrian and our efforts there. And then we also, with that collateral, we want to leverage our volunteers. We've worked with some of our partners, which I will get to talk about in a few minutes, and we want to leverage our volunteers to directly interact with our students and employees and visitors right here in the Memphis Medical District. Um, we are privy in our district to have um, great visitor um, attractions such as Bass Pro, which is very new to our district and new to our city. I think it's about a year and a half old. Uh, we have Sun Studios. We have breweries. We have eateries within our district. And so we often have visitors walking in and around our district, and we really want to make it a safe environment for them to do so. So looking at the education prong, I also want to uh, look at the opportunity to create and influence significant programming around pedestrian advocacy, specifically within the Memphis Medical District. Um, 
an example of this is the MMDC. We provide an event grant to locals, local individuals or organizations throughout the medical district who seek to bring people together within the district to not only promote the district and the good things we have going on, but also to incubate, incubate our green spaces. And we think that we can partner with some of these ideas around pedestrian advocacy and our event grant to really uh, enforce what we're trying to get through to our constituents. This could take, um, for example, place in a you know, walk to lunch day um, for the district or other pedestrian centered programming that would really not only expose our district, what our district has to offer, but also encourage walk and transit options. And I think um, that's something that all of the speakers can agree on on the call today, on the webinar, that is really um, important not only in the city of Memphis, but for our country to really transition to. So in really looking at the three E's that I provided, the engineering, which John Paul will take a deep dive really into our streetscaping, the enforcement two-prong approach, and the education um, that we feel we'll be leveraging here in the Memphis Medical District. I also want to discuss how we leverage the relationship with our partners um, here in the city. So as I stated at the beginning, collaboration is at the heart of the Vision Zero strategy for the Memphis Medical District. Uh, we have had the opportunity from the beginning to sit down with our partners with at Bike Walk Memphis, at Innovate Memphis, the City of Memphis, Livable Memphis, um, and other partners to really sit down and make sure that our strategies and tactics not only align with some of the programming and things they're doing around pedestrian safety in the city, but to also make sure that that reflects the current research and data. Some of the organizations that you see on the screen have already done some of the groundwork and foundation in explaining why we need a Vision Zero um, campaign here in the Memphis Medical District. And so it was important for us to work with them and create a bigger footprint in our small district and collaborate to really uh, push forward some of those similar ideas and strategies um, instead of doing it separately. So I encourage anyone on the call who's maybe thinking of taking on a Vision Zero um, or launching a Vision Zero campaign or strategy in your district or in your community to really think about those partners you can leverage and collaborate with to see um, how you can better build off each other and what you are currently doing in your own individual spaces. So um, I think that is my time. I'm not sure. I, Amiko said we will have time for questions later. I believe my contact information will be provided, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has following the webinar. I'm now going to hand it back off to John Paul. As you remember, he's the program director at Livable Memphis, and I think he's going to discuss more some of our streetscape plans and how he leveraged that with the Memphis Medical District. Thanks, Larissa. And I'm, not, I'm just going to breeze through these. I want to uh, leave time for questions. I, I think I can answer a couple of questions while talking about this. You may have seen, you know, we're, we're part of the big jump, um, and so People for Bikes has been kind of talking about how this uh, prototyping process is being made more permanent. Um, so someone had asked about removing parking for um, adding bike lanes and things like that. One of the things Memphis is both blessed and cursed with is insanely wide roads, uh, that many of which operate you know, well under capacity. Um, and this is a great example. You know, we've been able to retain parking in most of our road diet projects. Um, the city does have a process of individually notifying property owners when they are going to remove parking. Um, but most of this has been done without really impacting street parking. Uh, we also have a lot of surface parking, you know, another issue. Um, but just kind of an idea of this project that was in the medical district and why, you know, Larissa made a great point about partnerships being so important in doing this work. Um, just to kind of give you a quick sense of what this intersection looked like and the process of, um, you know, it's going kind of north to south. First, testing out some of these infrastructure, you know, with, with paint and flex posts and, and movable planters and things like that. And, you know, a really low-cost approach to redesigning these spaces. 
um, that, you know, again, it's kind of a temporary approach. You know, you really are testing something out. I like how we're able to incorporate some artistic elements into this. But then having a partner like the medical district that can come behind and do some of these more permanent uh, infrastructure projects. This was designed by somebody, our local person with Alta. Um, you know, they did a, a really great kind of look at what some of the needs were in terms of parking around the intersection and really moving people in through this space as efficiently and safely as possible, but then really also incorporating, this was our old automobile row, incorporating some artistic elements and you know, working with the property owners and the artists in the, in the neighborhood uh, to really spruce it up. And then they also did this district-wide. This is not at the same location. They've kind of made this, it's almost like a branded infrastructure improvement throughout the district uh, that really complements their um, their work on Vision Zero. I saw a question just say uh, how temporary the, it was maybe a year and a half um, between when we did the, the test drive, or maybe, a, maybe more like two years and when they made this permanent. This has just really been done uh, in the past several months. And with that, I think we're ready for questions. Thank you so much, John Paul and Larissa. Um, just so you know, there have been a ton of questions, and so I'm going to go ahead and moderate some that have been typed into the, the chat box, but what we always do is um, we have a follow-up blog uh, and recap post, which shares both a link so you can view the recorded webinar, and we'll also um, be asking John Paul and Larissa to answer these questions offline, and we'll, type, we'll go ahead and share those answers in the recap blog post. I'm going to start with you, John Paul, because I'm, uh, this is a question from one of the participants, but this is something that I'm really interested in is uh, project selection criteria. Um, when you are, and for those of you who don't know, when you're an MPO in your jurisdiction, your project selection criteria, I always say it as like a filter that you um, put all the projects through and then determine your list of essentially what's going to get planned and funded. Um, and the question was, why was equity only weighted at 10% for project selection given the history of disproportionate equity impacts in Memphis? Yeah, and that weighting, that scheme was um, for the Memphis's pedestrian plan. Um, so it was a very it was a very data-driven process that really looked at, you know, safety, at, at crash, crash history, um, road volume, all of these other things that, you know, it also looked at transit access. And so, like I mentioned, you know, equity was almost implicit in a few of those other things, but, you know, explicitly saying just 10% of this going into equity, um, you know, that was kind of developed through a steering committee. I don't know kind of what the wrangling process was to get to that 10%. Um, but, you know, the, the city wanted to have a very clear justification for spending public money. And I also saw a question pop up about why are we asking property owners to, and I can't get in, you know, that's something that was passed six decades ago. It's something we really are struggling with now is requiring property owners to maintain public infrastructure. Um, but you know they, they had to have a really clear justification for spending tax dollars on on something that legally is the responsibility of a property owner. So they needed to have a really data driven approach. I think picking schools as a focal point was a good you know political sell. Um, you know everybody loves to make things safer for kids. And um, so I, I don't know exactly how they end up with that 10% number. Um, but just the fact that you know that is an explicit part of the criteria, I think, is an improvement over where we were, you know, just a few years ago. Great, thank you. And then, Larissa, my question for you is also coming from one of the participants. So this is something I hear a lot. Um, Really the question is, you know, this had to do with politicians, but in general I've been speaking about Vision Zero and really the engineering, because it's where Complete Streets um, calls in, but this says politicians probably like the education E of the 3E strategy because it's visible and cheaper than engineering, but doesn't it provide more bang for the buck? Um, does engineering provide more bang for the buck or education? Um, Engineering. So the, the, there okay. tends to be a preference for education. I think one, it's 
and, you know, I will um, add my two cents in, but it's, it's a little bit more politically palatable. It's in a way cheaper to do. It's very fast. Um, and so it tends to be one of the favorite E's for people to do. Um, but the question I believe is getting at the fact that when you actually institute engineering um, or street design into preventing fatalities and serious injuries, you're actually getting more value in the long run. I would tend to agree. Um, like you said, the problem with engineering, it, there is a certain policy and political um, under, underlining foundation of it. So it is important if you are approaching a vision zero campaign, you have the necessary context, whether with the city or the state or with your community, community commissioners or whatever, however your um, municipality is set up, to have those necessary connects to get through some of the red tape. Fortunately for the Memphis Medical District, um, we have a great working relationship with our city and our city officials. So some of the streetscape work that John Paul deep dived in, some of that engineering, uh, part of that first E engineering approach, we were able to get through um, with a little less headache than others. Um, there is some headache with engineering and streetscape work, but it does provide over the long run um, a better tactic for decreasing some of the statistics we talked about today. I hope that great. answers your question. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. And again, there were so many questions, um, and we won't be able to get to them all because it's 158, but we will uh, go ahead and work with Lewis and John Paul to get answers to all your questions as well as their contact information. Um, I also wanted to uh, let uh, John Paul uh, talk a moment about, or Byron, an event that's coming up in Memphis in late June, um, and that is the APDP Professional Development Seminar. Um, and I can make one plug for it. I've only been to Memphis once, but I know the hotel that I've seen it has an amazing um, it's an amazing moment where the ducks come out and perform for everyone. But I'll let Byron and John Paul talk a little bit more about uh, what you can expect. Um, sure. I'm going to just advance the slide here. Uh, you know, we're really excited to have APPP bringing uh, the PDS to Memphis this year. Um, it is, the, the Peabody is a very historic hotel. Uh, it's right downtown. There's a lot of great work going on along the riverfront. and. Um, you know, we're going to be touring things like the medical district and, and hearing from them directly about some of these, these uh, street improvements and Vision Zero. Um, we're going to tour the Big River Crossing, which is our, our bike ped bridge across, you know, one of the widest points of the Mississippi River. Um, we're going to see things like Shelby Farms Park that's gone through a, a huge capital campaign in a 4,500-acre urban park. Um, and then, you know, there are going to be some really great sessions that go a little bit more into depth on the equity conversation, uh, on how we implement complete streets, and on, you know, one of the really important parts of it is there's a track on partnership. You know, I think that's been kind of a theme. And what I've talked about, what Larissa has talked about, I think, you know, health partnerships, education partnerships, all those kinds of things. So I think there's a lot of great content uh, that people will, will like to hear. We'd love to see everybody uh, here and, and talk in more depth about the work that's going on. I think that's, I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Great. Thank you, John Paul. So I encourage anybody that's able to to visit that. Um, with that, I just wanted to share that our next webinar will be in May, and it is Making the Most of the Main Street, Complete Streets, and Walkable Communities. We are co-hosting it, and I'm sorry the slide's not pulling up right now, but we are co-hosting it with America Walks and the Langley Main Street Alliance, which is based out of uh, Langley, Washington, in my home state, and we'll be sending out follow-up information about that shortly. And again, um, we plan on sending out the recap blog post within the next week, so thank you all. And um, as always, please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions, and a big thank you to our speakers today.